Today, we are delighted to have three Corwin authors from our new Five to Thrive series. Melanie Meehan, author of Answers to Your Biggest Questions about Teaching Elementary Writing. Christina Nosek, author of Answers to Your Biggest Questions about Teaching Element Elementary Reading. And Georgina Rivera, co-author of Answers to Your Biggest Questions about Teaching Elementary Math. And they will approach this webinar with a focus on creating a joyful classroom community. And for a nice surprise to start your week, we will be giving away three books at the end of the webinar. So be sure to stick around to see if you're one of our lucky random winners. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our presenters. Melanie Meehan has been the elementary writing and social studies coordinator in Simsbury, Connecticut since 2012. In addition to her Five to Thrive book, she is an author on two Corwin books, Every Child Can Write and The Responsive Writing Teacher. Christina Nosek is, passionate, is a passionate classroom teacher of 20 years and literacy ed education staff developer in the San Francisco Bay Area. She equally loves teaching children and supporting teachers in developing their classroom reading and writing communities. And Georgina Rivera, is a passionate math educator, coach, author, and presenter focused on equity, collective teacher efficacy, culturally, culturally relevant pedagogy, and teacher leadership. She currently serves as a school administrator for Bristol Public Schools and currently serves as NCSM vice president. And now I will turn it over to our three presenters. So, First, we want to say welcome on behalf of Melanie, Christina, and myself. We're so happy that you took time out of your busy schedule to spend it with us. But we first want to know how you're doing because for some of you, it may be early in the day. For some of you, it may be late. So I asked one of my students if they would create a check-in. So on a scale of one to five, well, how are you feeling today? And we're going to check in the chat. One is feeling like happy and maybe lovable. Number two is hungry because you may be hungry. Number three is good. Number four is a little sad. And number five is like you're ready to go already. <laughs> but hopefully you'll stay for the 45 minutes. So let's see where everybody's at. I see a lot of threes. All right, that's good. You got twos and threes. Uh, lots of twos. I saw one four. So we're going we're gonna to love up on that four because we don't want anyone to be sad. Hopefully there'll be a three by the time we're done. We have two, so feel free to grab a snack because you're off camera, so it's okay. It's okay to eat while you're here with us. Lots of threes. So that's great. So that's a great way to check in with folks. We do this with our students. They create these. They pick their favorite character. Some people ask me, are they culturally relevant? I'm like, well, if it's related to a hobby or interest they have, it could be. So kids really like to make these. We use these every morning during morning announcements, so feel free to use that. But I'm going to pass it off to... Christina, who I believe is going to get us started. So here we go. Hi, everyone. I'm just, I'm so happy to be here with Melanie and Georgina and all of you. And we are going to talk first, we're going to talk about three big things today. We're going to talk about uh, keeping the joy in community, finding joy in assessment, that is not an oxymoron. And also we're going to talk about finding joy in our instruction. So I'm kicking off finding joy in community. And this is a picture of uh, the most important members of my current community. Those are not my babies, but they are my brothers. Uh, he and his wife just had twins uh, on Valentine's day. So my community grew and changed and I'm just so overjoyed in that. And um, our communities in the classroom grow and change too. And as those communities are growing and changing, we need to work to find joy in those communities. And sometimes we need to change things and switch things up a little bit. Next. Oh, go back one. All right. So today I'm gonna to talk about my favorite way to uh, bring joy to my community while continually building, uh, building my classroom community. And I'd like to start with a quote from Maria Walther from her book, Ramped Up Read Aloud. And that is first and foremost, a read aloud should be a joyful celebration for all. Now as teachers, we are, I hate to say bogged down, but we kind of sometimes feel bogged down by all the pressure that we have 
with the testing, getting to all the standards, making sure all the students know the standards. But I'm going to give you permission right now. I'm going to write you a permission slip. Not every read aloud has to focus on a standard. It just doesn't. Some of our read alouds can be for community building. And no, while you are doing a read aloud with your class, your students are applying a lot of those standards that you've already taught to think about the read aloud. All right, next. So here's some, uh, or here are three read alouds that have brought joy to my classroom recently. I am currently a fifth grade classroom teacher, but you could use all of these books in a K through five classroom. I would even say in an older classroom as well. So sometimes in our community, we just need to celebrate reading and celebrate art. And a book I recommend to do that is How to Read a Book by Kwame Alexander. My fifth graders and I just had incredible conversation around this book a few weeks ago. In the art in this book, I know you probably can't see it very well in my little picture here, but the art in this book is just as worthy as talking about as the pictures. I highly recommend it. Another book to help uh, build community, and I actually read this with my fifth graders today, uh, Just Help. By, actually by Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. And in this book, it really talks about ways we can help when we feel like there's so much going on around us, what can we do? Our classroom community today talked about how we can serve a greater purpose um, through just helping, how to build a better world in our little section of the world. We had a wonderful discussion about it. And sometimes our community just needs to find comfort and find comfort in our own bodies and collectively together find it. And for this, I recommend Diana Farid's When You Breathe. All right, and as a bonus, a bonus book recommendation as well for community read aloud. Uh, if you're a middle grade teacher, this book is coming out later this month, uh, Wave, also by Diana Farid. It's a beautiful, um, beautiful poetry, uh, novel, written as a poem. And it's just a gorgeous story about a girl named Ava in Southern California in the eighties and what she goes through. All right, now I'm gonna pass it over to Melanie. Gotta go unmute here. I've got the multitasking going on of running the slideshow and presenting and listening for my cues. So thank you for bearing with me. Sorry about that first slide, Christina. Um, I'm gonna be talking about three big things that you can think about as a writing instructor that you can really do building your community. So above all, be a teacher who writes. That is a big one. And if you could just drop in the link here, um, the link to two writing teachers. Right now, two writing teachers is running the Slice of Life month-long challenge which if you are thinking about being a teacher who writes and thinking about a blog and wanting to maybe take that plunge, you are welcome to come in and join us. Um, even if you're late to the party, that's a-okay. I will say that um, some of the most insightful moments that teachers have had when, is when they have done the writing that they're asking students to do. Um, and I would say that from kindergarten all the way up to my sixth grade teachers that I'm working with. I just recently was working with a student about, or, or a teacher on um, an information writing unit. And she was wanting to follow what I had done and wanting to write the piece that I had written. And then she had kind of a moment of saying, you know, I really, I wonder about writing about cystic fibrosis because that means something to me. And that's what she did. And it made such a difference. And she understood what she was doing. So be a teacher who writes, whether it's drawing pictures in kindergarten or doing the research in fifth or sixth grade. Another thing that I would just say, building that teacher, building that writing community is always, always lead with what students can do and are doing and providing ways to celebrate those successes. One of the things that I really have started doing that disciplines me to lead with successes is keeping these conference cards and I leave them as sort of my conference favors when I'm working with kids. It makes me give them a compliment. And I, 
it's such an easy thing to forget. And it's such an important thing for building their confidence and for building their sense of spirit and positive outlook toward writing. And it's an amazing thing when you say to a kid, what was the compliment I gave to you? They can't always remember it. They don't even focus on it. So this really makes teachers focus on it and it makes kids remember it, which is a really powerful way for keeping that positive spirit alive in the classroom. So I would say that. And then finally, when I was at NCT a few years ago, Katie Cunningham was talking about leading with what can we learn from students instead of what we can teach students. And I think that when you approach kids with the mindset of what am I going to learn from you instead of what am I going to teach you, it changes up that sense of community. One of the things that Kelsey Storm and I have in our book, The Responsive Writing Teacher, and it's also included in this new one, is a form that really helps you get to know kids. So I would say, take a look at that form. If somebody could drop that in the chat, that would be great. Um, and take some time and really make sure that you are getting to know kids because there is so much that you're able to teach them and so much that you're able to inspire them with when you know and understand they, who they are and what matters to them. Um, so those are three big things that I would just say above all else, be and do when you are thinking about your writing community. So I love that you said that, Melanie, because um, in the math classroom, the way that I try to build community is through getting to know our students and centering students. And, that, and one big piece of that is culture. So in, in mathematics, part of culture is like knowing students' interests, their ethnicity and their hobbies and the ways that they learn best. And so one of the things that we spend a lot of time doing, and this is in the book on page 23, I pulled out the quote. Um, we talk about doing interest inventories with students and also asking them, what math do you do with your family? So if you look on the far left, that's an actual, like it's a, it's a Google slide we had kids made, but all they did was drop images of when they do math with their family. And for that particular student, they talked about cooking, they talked about an open air market, they talked about doing soccer, they talked about tile work at their house. And so they're doing geometry, elapsed time, working with decimals, fractions, all of that they're doing all the time. And that's all math. So what I'd like to hear from all of you, because we're a community and we're going to make joy is take a minute, think about what kind of math did you do with your family that was a hobby or something that you did on the weekend. So think about that. And once you know the answer, put it in the chat and let us all know, like, what kind of math did you do with your family? So give you a minute to think about that. And we'll, let's see what kind of answers we get. And then I'll share with you some of the things we do with our students. Lots of cooking. Yes. But they're individual, right? I'm sure you have like secret family recipes. I'm not allowed to see biking, basketball, right? Sewing, crochet is math, absolutely. Planning a party, building golfing, swimming. So, oh my gosh, let me just keep reading these, right? Trips is distance and time. Music is all fractions, right? Building family forts, that's geometry and measurement, people. <laughs> a lot of stuff there, right? You have to know. People didn't think about it. I'm like, we're doing math all the time. So why is this important? Because Kids really get excited when you take those contexts and bring them into the math classroom. You've got to teach fractions anyway. So let's talk about the fractions that they currently use. And so when we ask kids um, in the middle picture, what we do is we're actually talking about fractions, but they're talking about words that they know and how fractions are connected to them. How is it connected to their culture? How is it connected to their family? How are fractions important to them? And they share them on a shared piece of paper to create community and then they all read about them. And so that's a joyful way to learn about something and also create community. Um, playing card games, right? So much math in card games and we'll talk more about that. The one on the right is actually an activity we do at the start of the year with all of our young learners. It's about what is the length of your name? How many letters? And then what they do is they form a graph. Now you probably graphed lots of things in school, but they're just random, right? Graph this, graph this thing on this worksheet. 
Well, we don't do that. We, they graph their names and they're so proud of that. Which name has the most letters, which has the least. And then they tell the history of their name, where they got their name, the origin of their name. Sometimes they're named after family members. And so that's an amazing way to bring in culture. So those are just a few ideas that we include in the book on how to connect culture and math to build community. And I will say, anytime a student talks about themselves, you could see them light up with joy because kids really want to talk about themselves, whether it's a, through a book, through writing, or through math. The second slide, so next slide, is a different activity where they actually write a story problem about that. So we create community and joy through culture by writing their own math problems. Now in this, you'll see there's a student, she's researching a recipe. A lot of you wrote about recipes. She researched the recipe, she wrote the story problem, and then she shared it in front of her class. Now, if you know any of the work around culturally relevant teaching, which they're gonna put in the chat, a link to a book that's coming out by Dr. Shelley Jones and Lou Matthews. And I apologize, I haven't memorized, I think it's Yolanda Parker is the third author. So I apologize if I have that wrong, but um, they're connecting this to tasks, but, oh, I'm glad I got it right, yay. Um, but we talk about windows and mirrors. Well, what that little girl is doing is she's saying, this story problem is a mirror of me, let it be a window for you. And so when you bring culture like that into a classroom, it brings community, it brings joy. And if you look at those kids, they're all paying attention. Now, I don't know if you remember story problems. They didn't look like this. Usually the kids are like, I'm not doing those and kind of saving them to the end. But when they're about the students and their own lived experience, that brings joy. So you can learn more about that in the book. And I'm going to kick it off to Melanie, who's going to bring us to our next section. Yeah, so I'm just leading into the slides about assessment. And one of the things that I'm constantly assessing is how I can make my dogs not pull. <laughs> so these are these are my dogs, especially that one, the black one over there is a hefty puller. The little one just doesn't have the strength to really do too much. But I'm constantly changing up and thinking about the different harnesses or leashes or ways to control them so that I'm not getting pulled and I can walk them safely. Um, and it's joyful assessment, at least they would say so, like they're pretty happy to go. Um, what I would just say, and I talk about this in the book, is that uh, assessment has such a bad rap in a lot of ways, and it comes from the Latin word asidera, which isn't a totally positive word when I dig deep for the roots, but it does mean to sit beside. And I think that if you think about assessment as sitting beside, it changes it up a little bit. Like, can I sit beside you and, and then think about what's going on? So maybe as we think about the slides and you think about assessment, reframing it with the idea of sitting beside people is a, is a helpful way to bring to bring the joy aspect to it. Melanie, that was a perfect lead into what I'm going to talk about. And that is using conferences as a form of assessment. And really the conference is pulling up alongside a student and sitting beside them asking, huh, what is it that the student is doing really well as a reader? And what might be a possible next step? for this student. And really what Melanie mentioned earlier, what is it that we can learn from our students? Okay, what Melanie and uh, Georgina both mentioned earlier, in fact. So as we approach our students, one way to really put students in the driver's seat is to give them buy-in to the conference. Instead of just going and sitting down next to a student, asking them, may I join you? Really giving them that choice. And in all my years of confirming, I've only had one student ever tell me, no, I cannot join him. And that was because he was about to finish a really good book. And I was actually interrupting his space. So um, we want to be mindful of that. Is this a good time for the student? Because really, it's us entering their space. And as we're going in next, uh, next uh, thing. Thank you, Melanie. Um, I'm really seeking out first and foremost, what is it that the student is already doing well? as a reader, all of our students are doing something strategic. Every single one of them are doing something well as a reader. It's our job to figure out what that is and let them know. So 
some language we might want to use around that is one thing you are doing well as a reader is, and I like to say this instead of saying, I like, like, I like this, or I like that you did that, because really it's not about what I liked. It's about what the student did well as a reader. Next. And we want to reframe what a next possible teaching point or a next step might be for a student. We want to reframe it to that instead of looking for huh, what is the student not doing? Or what is the student not doing well? Or what is wrong here? That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for, all right, what is the next possible step as a reader for this student to grow? Okay, next. All right, and here's some reason why we do these things. Here's the purpose and the benefit. Next. So we want to approach uh, students' reading spaces as a guest because one, it establishes student comfort and it gives them agency. It puts them in the driver's seat. Next. And we want to, um, we seek out what our students are doing well as readers because not only does it inform our instruction in the moment, but it also informs our future instruction. It informs our instruction for what we might teach next, groups we might form, so many different things. It also, when we let students know what they're doing well, it really builds their confidence and then it possibly becomes a habit for them when we notice it and name it, like Peter Johnston tells us. All right, next. Okay. And then instead of telling students what they aren't doing or what they should be doing, we wanna use that language of, hey, would you like to hear a next step to help you grow as a reader? And every time I use that language with students, they sit up, they're excited, they're joyful. Yes, they want to know what they can do well as a reader. And this also informs our instruction. And again, it helps build that confidence in our students. And most importantly, it fosters that achievable growth. So um, can I have somebody please pop into the chat a little party favor on the different forms of formative assessment in the reading classroom? And conferring is one of those. And in my opinion, it's the most joyful form of formative assessment. And then I completely forgot to give my earlier party favor. Can I also have you drop the online resources for children's literature in there as well? All right. And I'm gonna throw it back over to Melanie. So <clears throat> getting into thinking about the assessment of writing, there are a few things that I want to say about this. One of the first things that I would say is um, you will create joy by slowing down. Like I think that sometimes there's so much of a hurry to get things done and to finish that mini lesson and get right to a small group or get right to a conference that we forget about just taking the time to slow down and think, okay, I'm just gonna let this transition and settle in. So I will say that practice of kid watching, which was really a Yetta Goodman initiative years ago. Um, but I would also say that I love Jennifer Saravalo's writing engagements. <clears throat> and I would say, use those. So when you think about the writing engagement, you can set yourself up with what kids are doing and what time they're even doing it, giving yourself all kinds of codes. This is a little party favor that we will put in the chat and you will get at the end. It's something that you can customize and tailor to however you wanna do it. But I would say a writing engagement is a super powerful way to discipline yourself to step back and check kids out. So that's one thing. But I also say <clears throat> that you wanna really develop your lenses. And when I say that, a lot of the time, the first thing that people think of when they're looking at writing is um, what are the what are kids doing as writers, meaning is there structure, is there development, are there conventions, how's the spelling going? And we do look at all of those things 100%. But I think, especially when you go back to thinking about being a teacher who writes, there's so much else that's involved in writing because it's a discipline. Like you have to stop, you have to sit down. One of the things that I know I have to do, I have to play my daily wordle. And other people doing that. Um, sometimes I have to do the quartal. If you haven't tried quartal, try that out. Um, 
I need my coffee. I need my blanket a certain way. Like there's a bunch of different things I need before I can initiate my writing. And there's some things that need to be in place for me to keep that stamina and stay writing. So my point is that it's not just all about the structure and the development and the conventions. And you can build joy when you sort of expand that lens into what else are they doing? Like, what have they got going as writers that they're doing? So again, this is a party favor and you can take it, you can make it your own, you can customize it with what are the things that you're looking at for your writers, put your kids' names down the list and be thinking about it. But what are kids doing that, that's really helping them become independent writers and keeping themselves on task? So again, I just invite you to make those your own and check those out, they're powerful tools. Um, you know, what are they doing? How can you tell that you're seeing it? When you start pointing that out to kids, sometimes that again is, is getting back into that asset-based lens of what are kids doing and how can I foster it? And it's a really important way of building joy in the classroom. I think another thing that, you know, one of the, one of the most important ways that we can build joy for ourselves in learning is taking ownership of it. Right, like at some point, there is so much joy in being in charge of what we're doing. So, I would recognize and prioritize and celebrate self assessment for kids every single chance you get. And that's not just a way to build joy, it's also a really top indicator of building, building strong learning curves when you look at the, the things that make a difference with John Hattie and all of the research he's done. So this is a form and, and this is a really fun one to give to kids and you get the results right away. You are again, welcome to take that, make it your own. But when you pass that to kids and you ask them what they're good at, you're bringing them into that whole process. And it's, I don't know if you've ever used Google Forms, but they, what they create for you is a really nice spreadsheet of information and data. So right there, you end up with not only kids self-assessments, but small groups of what kids are feeling good about and what kids are feeling like might be a nice, ne a nice next step. So anytime that you can use those sorts of forms and build that into the lives of kids, really super powerful. So again, that's a party favor. Please take that and use it. If you use any of these, especially those forms, I would love to hear it. Like, please reach out and let me know. I'd love to hear about how that's working. Um, my next one, and usually I'm, I'm into three, this slide I'm into four because Gina really inspired me when we were meeting and presenting this, is that you can really do a lot of assessment when you tap into the power of play. And I think that we forget that sometimes it's not about the big writing piece. It might be about the smaller things that kids are doing as writers. It might be about, can they build stories off of each other? It might be, can they tell funny verbal stories? It might be, can they combine sentences and, and put words together and evaluate things? Can they write six word stories? Like that's a super fun, powerful thing to do with kids. And I could, um, I could put the pressure on people and say, drop a six word story into the chat. I'm, I'm not so coordinated to really um, run the slides and check the chat at the same time and feel confident about doing that. But um, when you start writing six word stories and thinking of topics for them, and if you haven't heard of six word stories, I would say Google it, it's super fun. Um, but there's a lot that you can do with um, thinking about topics and building that kind of play in. Punctuation has a lot of opportunities for play. So again, four big things for really building how you incorporate assessment in a joyful kind of a way in a writing classroom. And again, I'd love to hear how any of you take any of these up. So um, one way that I love to assess in math classrooms is through math games. You probably remember that end of unit test, which is always very stressful in math. 
but that's not the only way to get to what students really understand. Because really what we heard earlier Melanie say was assess the sit beside. So sitting beside students as they're engaged in math games is a great way for you to understand what they currently know in math and where they need maybe a little scaffolding or they might have a misconception and you can help them. So in our book on page 119, we have some questions to kind of ask like, what is the purpose of this game? Because as I work with teachers, and especially new teachers, you know, it's fun to just play out a game, right? I was just going to pull out a game, but you have to have a purpose. So when you're playing this game, what standard is this game aligned to? Like, what do I am actually measuring? How are they going to play the game? And how will I know if they actually understand the topic? Like, what am I looking for? The other thing is, do students know how to play it? Is it like simple to play or overly complex where I can't actually get to the math? You want simple games where everyone can get to. And then where is the assessment opportunity? So many times I'll see students working and I'll see, I'll work with teachers and we'll create just a simple, you know, it'll we'll have a class list and we'll write down what standard we're looking for and we'll see where they are. Are they emerging at the standard? Are they proficient? Are they exceeding? Because now they're like taking the game to a whole other level. So just something like that. And I'll say to teachers, you don't always need the formal assessment. A game is a great piece of information that then you can carry on to report card because teachers always say to me, I'm worried about the report card. Well, if you have it documented formally on an observation tool that you've seen Christina add fractions correctly with the same denominator, then you're good. You don't have to always get to that written work. And so think about using games. And on the next slide, I show a couple of games where students are sitting beside one another. The first one is kindergarten and the kids are just rolling two dice and it's a paint stick and whatever they get as the total they'll put it down and the first person to fill up their side of the paint stick wins. That's a great way for kids to add numbers and know if they get totals correct and they work over and over and over and that's a very easy game to play paint sticks are free at the store and most people have two color counters. The second one are two students and they're talking about um, shapes and geometry. Now I'm, well, I'm a math language learner and I'm a multilingual learner. So a lot of times we're listening for math language because math has so many words. A great way to listen for that is during games. So I'll say to teachers, if we want students to know what a triangle is or a trapezoid or a rectangle, have them play with shapes and have them describe it. There's no need to put it on a written test. It's actually not authentic. These two students in the middle were playing with magnetic pieces and they were building every single shape. I'd be like, oh, what's a square look like? Boom, done. Check, done, I'm moving on. That's way more fun. It's a lot less stressful and it's a lot more joyful. And finally, two students working on addition and they're checking their own work with a calculator. So not only are they playing a game together because they're trying to get pieces on a game board, but then they're checking their understanding and they're assessing their own work. And if they have a mistake, they go back and try to find it because we're building a growth mindset. So assessing through games is a great way to engage learners and also get to know what they already know. Because our number one job as teachers is to get to know what kids already know and then help them to understand the things that they don't know yet. But what I found is through games, they know a whole lot. Now, I'm sure you're probably reminiscing of how many games you played back in the day. Think about all the board games you played that included math, right? You're rolling dice and trying to get to the end or trying to get rid of all your cards. Well, if it's indoor recess time, take out the games and let them play. And it's a great way for you to see if they have mastered some skills. So just a couple of ways to assess in a fun way, especially this time of year when sometimes, you know, things get tough, but games always bring joy. I so love that. And, you know, I, I think, Gina, one of the things that, that just strikes me as you're talking about assessment and looking at the pictures is it's not just about assessment, it's building community too. Like, yeah. The way that they're doing assessment is building community and that's so joyful. So these three things aren't mutually exclusive as we move into the realm of instruction. Yes, and I'm gonna put a party favor in. Uh, there was one earlier, which was the Corwin book on culturally relevant tasks. For this one, I'm gonna put in a couple of party favors. 
One is an article that I wrote for Corwin around joy. It was around the holidays and playing math games from around the world. So included culture and math games. So that'll be going into the chat. And then there are some open resources with math games that are there by grade level. So I will include those in the final party favor. So if you stick around to the end, you'll see their printable math games you can use and they cover the major work of each of the grade levels. So there's lots of options there. So enjoy those at the end. Now for this final piece, we thought about, well, how do we make the instruction joyful? Because we talked about our community, we talked about assessment. And so this slide is actually related to my family because as I did my college visit with my nephew, I got to spend time in his classroom at Roger Williams um, University in Rhode Island. And he's like, Titi, can you teach my class? And I was like, of course, but in the first photo, photo they were being very bad students. As you can see, my family was acting up, I know. I was a little annoyed. So I was like, had to set out some community norms and all of a sudden they're on track as you can see, and see inside too. So instruction has to be joyful. I think it was a little boring in the beginning but when I made it joyful, it seemed to get them all on track. So if it works for my family, I'm hoping it'll work for all of us. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna hand it off to, I believe, Christina. Yes, yes, Yay. yes. So I'm gonna talk about, um, <laughs> what I think is one of the most joyful parts of a classroom, and that is the classroom library. So a critical part of reading instruction is really setting up and maintaining those conditions that keep students engaged, that keep students bought in, that keep them wanting to come back for more. And so much of that is giving them ownership. And this can happen um, starting in kindergarten all the way up the grades. So one way I love to do this is through student created book boxes. So you'll see on the left here, uh, this is an example of a primary grade um, student book box creations. And this is actually in my friend Haley's classroom, one of my colleagues. So here you see students created uh, two book boxes, uh, bugs, and then underwater animals. And then in my fifth grade classroom, these are two examples of book boxes that my students just created. Um, the first one being cooking, and then the next one, um, books about kids our age and books about kids who feel different. And this all came from the students. And the way that we approached this, both in the lower grades and in the upper grades, was asking students how is it that you wanna find books in the library? What is it that you personally are looking for? How would you arrange things if you had that chance? So really a lot of it too is us letting go of control as teachers, which is super hard. We're teachers, we're the one in charge. It's hard to let go of that control. But when we do, when we put students in the driver's seat and they create a lot of their environment and their conditions, their engagement grows, and thus they're more bought into the instruction. All right, next please. Okay, so now that we have these student created book boxes, another way to um, really bring joy into our reading instruction is student led or student created groups and partnerships in reading. Next. So consider topical book groups or partnerships to learn more about a topic or how to do something. And this is something um, Haley's first grader said, we both always wanted to learn more about bugs. So together, we're going to read those books in the bug book box. Next. Okay. Also consider fiction book clubs or partnerships reading different texts to explore relevant or relatable themes. My students actually did this with the book box um, first in a series. They created a first in a series book box and each student actually read a different book as part of this club and talked about and explored those themes together. Next. Or craft clubs to inform their writing. We've really, we really like this author's books. So we wanna try out what she does, what this author does by exploring her different books and then working together to apply it into their writing. Next. And another example of this would be student led groups would be social issues clubs to explore curated articles curated by you, the teacher about relevant topics. 
this matters to us. So we want to learn more about how it is that we can help. All right. And I have a party favor that goes with this, and that is tips for student-led groups and partnerships. It's not always easy to let go of that control, having the teacher, having us, me, lead the groups. So here's some tips that'll help you get students in charge and students leading the way. Sorry, I jumped that gun. Christina, were you done? Okay, so I'm taking it on from here, talking about the instruction. And I will say one of the first things that I always say when I'm looking at classrooms is do the kids know the routines and structures and expectations of the classroom? And, I, you know, it, initially you don't really see the joy in this, but the thing of it is, is that my sister-in-law always used to say love is limits. Like her kids craved that, like give me, give me the structure of my boundaries and they were happier kids. I will say, I, I think it's really similar when you think about what's my role and what's kids' roles in the workshop. And when the teacher understands their role during the mini lesson and the kids understand it, same as in independent writing time, I'm looking at it from a writing workshop lens, whatever kind of writing instruction class you're using. Kids need to know their role during the different parts of it and the adult needs to know their role. And the more that they understand that, the more productive it is. And there's joy both in the limits of the roles and in the productivity that happens because of them. So those are two, th those are big things. We'll also say, and I, I was just having a conversation with somebody about this today. And Eileen, I think you're, you're here. I've been seeing you in the chat. But there is joy that comes when you respond to the writers in front of you based on what they need to learn. And when you are in their zone of proximal development and teaching them based on where they are and what they can do independently without having somebody telling them step-by-step step every inch of the way, there's joy in that independence. And I just say tap into that whenever and however you can. That's, that's really part of knowing the curriculum and knowing the standards and knowing how to shift um, both backwards and forwards so that kids have their on ramps. Um, huge, huge benefits to giving kids opportunities for success. Then the final thing, and, and again, I, I feel like I keep saying about talking about the joy of independence. And when I look at even Gina's pictures of kids playing and thinking about Christina's baskets of books, there is joy in, in finding independence and giving kids tools and opportunities to own the classroom and own aspects of their own learning. So um, I would like this dropped into the chat. Chris, um, Megan Hargrave a couple of years ago wrote a really powerful post that gave me language to talk to teachers about what I meant by silent teaching partners. And I would say, you know, go ahead and read that, but you might want to create a chart like the one that I just dropped in of what are the tools that exist in our classroom that you can tap into when I'm not available? And again, there are charts, there are checklists, there are mentor texts, there's each other. There's all these different things that you can find and you can use when I'm, when I'm working with somebody else, which lends, which goes right back to that thinking about the writing workshop during independent writing time. Your job is to figure it out yourself. It's not to get behind me like a little pack of ducks and follow me around asking questions and waiting for me to answer. It's to figure out your problem, your, your, your issue and find a solution. And the more that you can give kids those silent teaching partners so that they can do it, the better that will happen. One of the things, if you go back to that, those assessment charts that I, that I put in is, are kids accessing the different resources that exist in the classroom? That's a form of an assessment and it really benefits your instruction. So I'd say they're, they're mutually compatible um, and inclusive and I would just tap into the power of all of that. 
I'm gonna pass that to Gina. Okay, thank you so much. So for instruction, I'm probably saying something that might be surprising to some people because I'm all about math, but I think one of the best ways to bring joy to math instruction is to use children's literature. And some of it is specifically written for math and some of it are just really great stories that have amazing images about math that help students create a context for learning. And what I mean by context is like a scenario or background knowledge. So if you were in math classes before, you probably remember like sometimes a worksheet full of numbers, but if they're not tied to anything, they don't really mean anything. But when you tie them to a beautiful story, you can always go back to that story and those characters to help engage students in the learning. So many times I'm asked, when should you use a book? And so in our book on page 108, there is a chart there and you can actually use literature anytime throughout a unit. So you might use it before a unit to kick off a unit to really build that context for learning or just to pre-assess what they already know. For example, we did a second grade book the other day where it was about an old truck and there was a lot of shapes in it. Well, come to find out by the time we were done with the book, the kids had named every single shape and there was no need for the unit. So there you go. <laughs> like there was no need to teach all of these shapes because the hardest shape in the book was a trapezoid and the kids like oh there's a trapezoid there on that page and i'm like okay we're pretty much done <laughs> so before is a great pre-assessment it's not a written test it's just a story during the unit um, you can use it to reinforce vocabulary for english language learners i can tell you or multilingual learners it's amazing to use stories especially culturally relevant stories and you'll see one on the next slide that i'll share um, it provides multiple representations, so you get to see the numbers in lots of different ways. And then at the end of a unit, you can use it to culminate. So I used to read a book at the end of a unit to really see what do students understand after learning this unit of study. And even as an enrichment or extension, so I've given kids books to say, hey, read this on your own and then tell me where the math is in the book. And they come up with these presentations. Some of them do posters or slides. And they tell me all of these amazing things because we have book bins related to different topics. So for my party favors, I'm putting in two Padlets. There's a K2 one, it's math, it's literature that can be connected to math. And there's a three, five, so grades K to two and three to five. And on the next slide, here's an example of a story and how we used it. So um, thanking the moon, um, is by Grace Lynn. And in that you learn about mooncakes, which is a food that's used to celebrate the new year. Well, in that we created um, a mooncake spinner and we talked about teen numbers because throughout the book, you see the family eating lots and lots of mooncakes to celebrate the new year. And so we said, well, wouldn't it be fun to actually create a mooncake spinner and then have kids tell us how many mooncakes they're gonna have at their party? Well, they did. So you'll see the kids filled up their 10 frame for their number of tens and then the red are the ones. And then they would look at how many they have. And if you can see their whiteboards, you, all their equations are there. So 10 and two is 12 and 10 and three is 13. And so they were learning about teen numbers, but through a story and not your traditional food, through mooncakes. Now for my students who knew what they were, they were so happy to share, like we have these during our holidays. This is amazing. I can't believe you have this. And for kids who have never learned about it, they learned about a brand new food. They learned about a brand new culture and they're learning math. So I always say use a great storybook to launch learning and math because it makes for a great context and bring lots of joy. Next slide. So we just want to say as a group, Christina, Melanie, and myself, that whatever we learn with joy, we never forget. So if you go back to your school experiences, you probably remember the things that brought you the most joy. It's always the scary things and the really fun things, that fun project or that thing that just like you created or that favorite activity that used to play. So I just say make learning joyful, make assessment joyful, and make your community joyful. And how do we do that? I think you heard it from all of us. We need to center our students and get out of the way. It's not about us, it's really about our students. So we wanna hear from you. On the next slide, you'll see a quick chat question. You heard lots of ideas today. I know I learned a lot from Christina and Melanie and I'm grateful for them. What was something that resonated with you that you're gonna to commit to trying out? So we're gonna give you a minute. So think about that. And then once you have your idea, go ahead and put it in the chat. You just, there it goes. All right, and you can add it. I'm just gonna 
look at all the ideas. Thank you for sharing. They assess my assessments, get to know my students, make learning fun and play, yes. Read with students, incorporate literacy and math, writing engagement forms, playful writing, visible posters. These are so amazing, aren't they, Melanie and Christina? Yeah, they're super fun. I love the just the commitment to play. Like that mm -hmm. was really coming in the idea that assessment can be playful no matter which what what which one of our three domains they're in. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, find find the play in assessment. You can find out a lot in a game. Yeah, and centering students. I think that's a common theme, centering students here. Because like Gina said, it's it's not about us, it's about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're not watching the chat and I'm kind of going back and forth, I'd say take a look at it and really you can get so many ideas from what people have taken away from what we've said, like the idea of doing conference cards for math and reading, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just about writing, you could make them for all three subjects and that's a pretty cool idea. Yeah. So I'm gonna move along to the next slide, which I think is about what, wow, that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> Um, <laughs> which is our digital party favors. And then I thought that there was a slide um, for questions. Uh, before I get to that, this is the slide that you will get a copy of as, in an email. So you will have access to those party favors that we were, that we were putting out there. We kind of compiled them all in one place. So if you signed up for this and Corwin has your email, this is coming your way. If you don't get that and you want to make sure that you do, you are more than welcome to reach out to one of us or reach out to Corwin and we'll get that to you. Um, and then I think that we have time for some questions in the chat. If there are questions, um, am, I, am I doing that correctly? Margaret, Sophie, is that what you're envisioning? We could probably take a question or two. Okay. Um, <laughs> somebody loves that we call them party favors. That was really, a, I think that was um, from the Here for Teachers presentations that we did. We have our party favors. Um, do I have writing games or resources? I do have, I've written about writing games and playful ways to do writing on two writing teachers. Uh, there are posts um, there. So if you wanted to go and just search on two writing teachers for playful ways of, for writing, they're there. Um, I didn't put that as a party favor. Um, will we share the links in the chat in an email? Yes, that will be coming your way, Wendy. Um, Fran, thank you. Thank you. Welcome to all the thank yous. Thank you for coming. I don't know if we said that emphatically enough. This is an extension of your day and we appreciate that you're here. We, we, we know it's March and everybody is kind of like, oh, so thank you so much for showing up and being here. Um, do we have Spanish bilingual resources? I don't, Gina, I'm gonna keep that one to you. So um, for some of the read alouds, some of them you can purchase in Spanish. So I would go to um, the website, I'll put it in the um, chat, a website where you can see some names of some of the stories. In terms of games, what I've tried to do is if they're just numbers, what I do is I take the instructions, I copy them and put them in Google and I'll translate the directions and then I'll leave the game board because the game boards usually still work. 
So that's a way to get around it. We've shared them at family math nights. So whenever I have a family math night, I'll have the English and Spanish version. Um, so it's just the directions and I'll have it two sided, one side English, one side Spanish. And it's really about the directions. The dice will still work. The numbers are still the same. So that would be one small lift for the books like uh, the Sotomayor book that um, Christina shared that I have it in, in I have it in Spanish right on my bookshelf back here it comes in English and Spanish so you just have to take the time to look for that title and look for the Spanish version because what I'm noticing is they're doing more translations more and more and so whenever I buy a book if they have both I buy both um, so that would be a starting place I would say for some of the resources I haven't found a full out like one stop shopping but that's a need. And I know that um, Corwin has a lot of books around multilingual learners and math specifically that they're talking and they might give a nod to some resources there. So I hope that's helpful at least to get you started. Um, Gina, there's also somebody, Christine, who's interested in having the Tigger rating from the beginning. Is there a way that you could add that into the party favors? Like just that, make that one slide? Yeah, and I'll add that one to the um, party favors and then I'll, um, I'll go out in the email. Okay, and then you know what? What I'll also say is that on um, if we go back, right? There was the where was the contact slide where they can reach us? Oh, it was the party right. favor slide. So on that party favor slide, yes. Um, here are ways that you can reach any one of the three of us. So if there are specific questions or there's something specific, some re specific resource that we mentioned at some point, you are welcome to reach out to us. Like just send me an email. We have um, reach out on Twitter. I know a lot of you I follow or you, we follow each other. Just feel free to get in touch. I'd love to hear from you and we'd be happy to share whatever you're looking for. Okay. Am I missing anything in that? I'm going back to the chat. I think that was that was mostly it. Just thank you so much, everybody. I, I appreciate I was telling everybody earlier this was my first time presenting in months and months. So it felt good. Thank you. Thank you for being so kind and welcoming. This was a, a fun virtual audience. So Margaret, do you want to talk about the winners? Yes, and I wanted to thank Melanie, Christina, and Gina for adding joy to a Monday. That was fantastic. And all of those resources, which you, everyone who's here will receive a recording of the webinar, your certificate of attendance, as well as their complete party favor with all of these wonderful resources. So you, you will get that via email in the next few days. And now to announce our three lucky winners, Lisa Noble, Charles Triggs, and Ashley Taylor. And we'll be in touch with you via email. You'll get to let us know which book you would like to have. And if you could go to the next slide. And if you weren't one of our winners, we do have a code for 30% and free shipping. The code is webinars22. That's in all caps. And then this is a complete um, lineup of the whole Five to Thrive series, some of which um, are, are out and coming out in the next few weeks. And um, by June, all six of these books will be available. So thank you, um, everyone, for participating tonight, and especially to Melanie, Christina, and Gina.